heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow. Back in San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Amazon pushing further into the world of generative AI with an up to $4 billion deal with Anthropic. We're going to be sitting down with Amazon Web Services CEO Adam Slipsky to discuss. And Hollywood screenwriters strike a tentative deal with studios to end their months-long strike. We break down everything you need to know about the agreement. Plus Apple's cheapest iPhone 15. Well, it's winning over buyers with wait times for the device almost doubling compared to this time last year, Ed. Yep, let's get straight to our top short story. Amazon will invest up to $4 billion in the AI startup Anthropic. It is a complicated deal where Anthropic will move its software to AWS Cloud, but also the training of its future models to Amazon's proprietary silicon. We are talking about the AI accelerators Tranium and Inferentia. This is kind of an interesting move for Amazon that's done so much work internally on generative AI tools, but now it looks to a third party. Of course, the Claude large language model is one with billions of parameters. It is one that was already available within Bedrock, the platform that Amazon through AWS offers to build your own LLMs or take advantage of pre-built skeletons of LLMs. There are many questions to be posed about the strategy here from Amazon and AWS with regards to generative AI and what's going on with their proprietary tech. We want to welcome our Bloomberg television and radio audiences worldwide. Joining us now, Amazon Web Services CEO, Adam Salipsky. And Adam, welcome to Bloomberg Technology. I want to start with some of the mechanics of this deal. Does Anthropic still pay Amazon to use AWS Cloud? Or is it structured such that the investment that you make in Anthropic is in the form of cash and credits for AWS Cloud? Uh, No, good morning and thanks for having me. We're very excited uh, for this expanded relationship with Anthropic. And uh, the the investment is a financial investment, as you say. Uh, And uh, in addition, uh, Anthropic will be uh, training future versions of its models and running its models uh, on AWS using our uh, Tranium uh, chips and uh, Inferentia chips. Uh, those models will be guaranteed to be available for years to come in our Amazon Bedrock managed service for LLMs, which provides a very wide choice of models. And AWS customers will actually receive early access to key features in Anthropic's models in the future, such as fine-tuning and customization of models. In addition, uh, Anthropic's got very talented technical teams, and we anticipate uh, working closely with them to actually improve future versions of our training and inferentia uh, chips. So uh, it's a, there are a lot of different benefits for our joint end customers from this relationship, and we're, we're very excited to be leaders in this together. Adam, there's a lot of emphasis on moving a maker of foundation models at that scale onto your proprietary silicon. How quickly will Anthropic start running AI workloads on Tranium and Inferentia? Well, uh, well, well, we've been working with Anthropic. They've been a customer of ours since, I think, their founding uh, over a couple of years ago. And so they use a, a variety of different uh, technologies for a variety of different workloads on AWS. Uh, they, uh, it, that they'll be using uh, GPUs uh, on AWS, and we'll also be using uh, large quantities of Tranium and Inferentia. So I think everything's going to move uh, very quickly and uh, it'll all be you know, a, a mix of technologies depending on their needs at the time. Adam, what's the mood like within Amazon and AWS this morning? There are lots of talented engineers that have been working on large language models, generative AI tools internally, and now you're turning to a third party who's highly regarded as a leader in building foundation models. Uh, the mood here is great. Uh, we are a company of inventors who we love to build. And there's never been a better time to be a builder at AWS than, uh, than right now. And uh, as I mentioned before, it, 
a big part of our strategy in AI and uh, generative AI specifically is all about customer choice. And there's not going to be um, you know, any one solution uh, that works for all customers, for all use cases. And Anthropic has done an amazing job. They're uh, clearly a, a, a leader in this space. And it's really important for customers that uh, we continue to generate new capabilities uh, together. At the same time, uh, really the one of the hallmarks of our Amazon Bedrock managed service for uh, generative AI is choice. And so uh, Amazon is going to continue to build its own Titan models, which are going to be available uh, uh, later this year. Uh, obviously, Anthropic's models uh, are prominent in Bedrock. And we'll have uh, models from other uh, leading providers as well as as we have today. So it's still an amazing time uh, to build here at yeah. Amazon. Uh, we think our models are going to be great as well. And it's about customers choosing the right tool for the job. Talking about choice, and I just want to rewelcome our TV and radio audiences with Adam Salipsky. What's so notable is that, well, Anthropic took a chunk of change, $400 million worth, from Google already. And I'm interested as to how you feel that is perhaps a concern for you or not, the relationship that Anthropic already has with a previous cloud provider. No, we feel great about the uh, uh, relationship with Anthropic. It's been a good relationship, and I think today's announcement just makes it a, a, a deeper uh, and, and longer term. Um, Anthropic will uh, use AWS as its primary cloud provider for mission-critical workloads, including building um, foundational foundation models and doing uh, AI safety research, and will run the majority of its workloads uh, on AWS. So uh, we feel great about being able to provide the capacity and the expertise and, of course, the security, the enterprise-grade security mm. that is so important to AWS customers. And we also feel great about working with Anthropic to make sure that our Tranium and Inferentia technology uh, our chips uh, are uh, as as cutting edge as possible going forward for years to come. I'm interested in drilling down sort of on where Ed was going about the feeling internally right now, because I look at some of the analysts' reaction to this, Adam, and Wedbush, for example, they say this signals a newfound urgency in Amazon's strategy to further integrate generative AI among your AWS suite of services. That urgency, was there a lack of understanding or indeed a reality that Amazon was behind the curve here a little bit when it came to the integration of generative AI? Because we've been looking at OpenAI and Microsoft for a while now. Oh, we've been saying for many, many months, uh, Carolyn, that we are fully urgent. We have a strategy that we really love. It is different than some other cloud provider strategies. It's true. Uh, we have a strategy of uh, providing absolutely uncompromising security which I don't think is true for all cloud providers. We have a strategy of providing customers the choices to use whatever is best for, uh, for their job at hand. So uh, Anthropic is going to be uh, an amazing set of models for many, many use cases. And uh, Amazon is, is fully invested in building its own uh, Titan models, which I think will be really useful for other customers in other circumstances. Uh, and, and of course, our other, uh, our other model provider partners uh, th through Bedrock. So um, I, I really um, think it's an ill-founded premise that there's been some change in urgency. We're fully urgent here on generative AI uh, for one reason and one reason alone, because our customers need us to have great generative AI capabilities. So many of them have their data platforms on AWS, and if you've got your, your data here, um, uh, you, you really want to have your generative AI and all the powerful capabilities that you need from those capabilities uh, in the same place. And so we're, we, we have been, are, and will continue to be very motivated to deliver for customers. Adam, what does this mean for the kind of ramp up or path forward for Tranium and Inferentia? You, you, you've put a lot of emphasis that Anthropic brings you a maker or, or creator of foundation models at scale. Will you now need to ramp up, I guess, your third party manufacturing relationships to say, OK, let's get more Tranium on, more Inferentia online to support the workloads? Well, it's absolutely true that there is a huge demand for uh, all of the different chips uh, with which people do uh, a generative AI workloads. And uh, so we absolutely have already been ramping up our training in Inferentia uh, supply chain and uh, ramping up the, the supply that we can create as quickly as possible. And yes, uh, Anthropic will have access to uh, very significant uh, quantities of compute which will have Tranium and Inferentia in them. So yes, that's one of, of, of many uh, reasons why we continue to, to ramp up and to provide a, a very robust AWS controlled supply chain for AI chips. 
And is that where the revenue boost comes? Adam, because we're looking at the share price reaction it is higher on the day. When does this all start to really drive adoption, money and the bottom line for Amazon? Well, I think that uh, AI in general, look, AWS has had machine learning services since at least 2017 when we released uh, our SageMaker machine learning service, which uh, has over 100,000 AWS customers on it. So we've been doing machine learning for a long time inside of AWS. And uh, obviously, more recently, I've had a significant uh, number of generative AI customers. And we will certainly uh, continue to ramp up, I anticipate, you know, quite steeply. We have many sources of growth inside of AWS. We're a, um, a, a, a scaled and relatively sizable business uh, at this point. And uh, customers are running their data uh, platforms on AWS. Uh, they are uh, building out more and more applications for things like supply chain and uh, contact center management on AWS. Uh, still a whole lot of storage and compute and database workloads ramping in on AWS. So uh, we have many sources of, of, of growth, I anticipate, but there's absolutely no doubt that generative AI uh, looks like it's going to be an, an, ex an explosive additional source of growth uh, in the years ahead. Uh, Adam, we put a lot of emphasis on the up to $4 billion. And you know, I understand and thank you for explaining how the, the relationship will work in practice. If I put to you, this is an example of Amazon or AWS basically paying a leader in the field of AI, handing over cash to allow to make them use Trainium and Inferentia. How would you respond to that and explain to me how you bring new customers on board who are really interested in the AI accelerators that you have, have built without having to invest in them uh, in, as a sort of backup? Sure. Well, the, I think the, um, the, the really big news today is the, uh, the new expanded relationship uh, between Anthropic and Amazon, uh, in which uh, they will have access to uh, really large quantities of training and inferential chips. Uh, customers will have access to those models, including uh, early access to critical features through Amazon Bedrock. And uh, Amazon will get to, uh, AWS will get to work with Anthropic to uh, ensure that, uh, you know, we optimize our training and inferential technology going forward. That's the benefit for customers. Uh, and yes, as part of this, uh, we're pleased to be making uh, an, initial, an initial investment of $1.25 billion into Anthropic. It's a financial investment and uh, that could go up uh, as high as $4 billion, as you, as you said, over, uh, over time. Uh, but it's really driven around customer value and what this is going to mean to customers who are you know, very, very uh, determined, as they should be, uh, to figure out generative AI strategies. Uh, we already are working in depth with customers, as is Anthropic. Uh, on forming those strategies and actually moving to execution. We have a lot of great customers from Lonely Planet to Nexus Lexus uh, and a, a number of others who are, are actually moving to production uh, with generative AI on AWS and Anthropic. And in addition, as you alluded to, we'll be working with uh, all uh, of the partners that our customers want to do business with. If it's an important partner to our customers, it's going to be an important partner to us as well. Amazon Web Services CEO, Adam Salipsky. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Ed, let's have a quick check on what else is happening outside the world of AI, or is it? Because remember, the strikes were upon us, both writers and actors, and in some part that was to do with artificial intelligence, but much more as well to do with the pay of writers in particular. Could we be getting a breakthrough? Certainly we seem to be close and seem to be announcing some sort of deal from the writer's side of the equation. We're higher on Netflix, but Warner Brothers still underwater at the moment, down by some 3% after an initial pop. We'll be digging into that particular Hollywood story in a moment. This is Bloomberg Technology. Hollywood writers and studios are reaching a tentative deal, we understand, over the weekend to end strikes, which began back in May. Let's dig into this with someone who's been on it non-stop, Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw. And can you just go to the intricacies of what we think a deal has been struck on here? So the, the biggest issues are the, the ones that they hadn't already reached some kind of deal on are related to minimum staffing. So having a you know, minimum number of writers who are hired to work on a TV program. Um, and then data transparency slash payment and success. So studios and streaming services 
being more open about how many people are watching their shows and then paying writers uh, bonuses, basically, if they perform up to a certain level. And then some agreement around artificial intelligence and what studios can and can't do with the scripts they own. We have I have some sense of the particulars on, on each of those points, but they haven't released the, the full details of the proposal just yet. You know, Lucas, the state of production is still worth considering, right? The actors strike is ongoing and talks are ongoing there. But the net result appears to be that, you know, late night talk shows that don't require actors, they might start getting underway soon. Yeah, the, the, the broader guild still needs to ratify this agreement. It's sort of the negotiating committees for both sides that have agreed to this. There may be a condition of this where daytime talk shows, late night talk shows are able to go back sooner than it's ratified. I believe that happened with the 2000, 2000, 2007, 2008 writer strike. Um, but either way, people expect the Guild to ratify, and in the next couple of weeks, we should see those shows get up and running. You're right that production on a lot of film and television can't happen just yet, uh, but they could begin pre-production. They could start writers' rooms for some of those shows. You know, they, there were shows that were supposed to be on new in the fall in September that hadn't even started writing scripts yet. So that's something that could begin now. For many, this is a relief for the writers who've been unable to work, but also the entire ecosystem that's built around them, Lucas. And I'm interested as to who are the key players, the key figures that got in the room to try and push this forward? Well, for most of the negotiation, you had or the, the negotiating committee on the writer's side and then the top labor lawyers on the side of the studios as well as their representative with this body called the AMPTP, this woman, Carol Lombardini. Uh, but you also saw in recent weeks, and especially over the last week, the CEOs of some of the biggest media companies get personally involved. That included Walt Disney CEO Bob Iger, Netflix co-CEO Ted Sarandos, Warner Brothers Discovery CEO David Zaslav, and Donna Langley, who's the chief content officer for NBC Universal. They were personally involved in the negotiations for much of last week, um, and are are. No, they're, they're, they're not necessarily the heroes of this situation, but their, their involvement did signal the seriousness with which the studios were approaching the negotiation and put something of a, of a timetable on it. Mm. All right, Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw reporting through the weekend and here on Bloomberg Technology. Thank you. And a programming alert. In about two weeks, Lucas will be hosting Bloomberg Screen Time in L.A to cover the collision of Hollywood and Silicon Valley. He's bringing together moguls, celebrities, and entrepreneurs already defining the next phase of pop culture. And if you're lucky, your two favorite Bloomberg technology anchors as well. This is Bloomberg. on generative AI, let's go there again, because the company Forethought, it's trying to take on some key competitors like Salesforce, for example, in the customer service department by launching Autoflows. It's a customer support tool using simple natural language prompts rather than manual workflows, ticket-based systems. The whole system is powered by Support GPT. That's Forethought's generative AI model, which in itself is powered by open AI models. Let's bring in Forethought CEO Dion Nicholas now for more on this deal. And Dion, it's really interesting that you're really trying to drive home customer service here in a more natural, easier manner. Can you just say how much at the moment this is held back by lack of AI, how much you actually think it will change the game and take an individual out of the equation? Absolutely, Caroline. Thanks for having me. And so when we think about the, the state of the art in AI right now, it's been hamstrung by manual workflows, decision trees, rules, keywords, and that's why every single chatbot we've ever interacted with, we get that age-old experience of, hey, I need, a, I need to talk to an agent. I don't really understand what's going on here, right? And so I think this is actually the future uh, for customer support. Not fully iterative yet, you said, within some of the discussion points. It requires you still perhaps through the old additional task manually. But when do you think we might never have to have that age-old, I need to speak to an agent now? <laughs> 
I think we're very close, right? With Autoflow's technology, you simply specify the goal or the prompt, and you let AI do the rest. And this has become really, really powerful. We're, we've already seen uh, this technology live in some of our private beta customers. We're launching uh, or we're announcing an open beta uh, this past week. Uh, we've seen stats from some of our customers where the customer satisfaction scores have gone up by 27%, um, and we're already serving thousands of conversations on this. So we're already seeing the benefits of autoflows, and I think the future is closer than we think. There are many audience members of Bloomberg Technology that will be used to the ticket-based system. Some participants in the show are also used to it. <laughs> Give us one case study, a simple one, that, that your technology will replace. Yeah, I think... A lot of the ticketing systems, so if you look at you know, Salesforce, Sendesk, folks like that, um, they've all been talking about this autonomous AI future. Um, you've seen at the Dreamforce uh, announcement, Einstein co-pilot being announced that it's coming sometime in the future, sometime next year. Uh, we're already seeing use cases like Upwork, uh, who've leveraged auto flows for a, lot, uh, for a few of their um, workflows in their customer support center. Uh, and they've seen uh, improvements in customer satisfaction and deflection rate by leveraging autoflows instead of traditional uh, manual workflows in some cases. Support GPT is built on GPT 3.5? GPT 4. GPT 4. Yeah. So what's that been like in the, in the few weeks and months since you were last on the show, building out the technology with that underpinning? Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been really fun. Uh, at Forethought, it's kind of in the name. We've always been about bringing the future to now. Right, And so we've often leveraged our own technologies, our own models, and we also leverage the latest and greatest. And so um, it started with GPT 3.5. I think that was it when I was last on, on uh, this show. Um, and we've focused on innovating. It's not just about large language models, which are uh, in many ways new for people. But for us, we've seen large language models over the past few years. And we think the future is about autonomous AI or agentic AI. And so leveraging the latest and greatest technologies, not just for language, but for action that can, uh, and AI that can go and take action on your behalf and solve customer problems has been uh, huge. 30 seconds, Dion. Is this going to mean less jobs? I think long term, I'm extremely bullish that AI will actually create jobs for people. We saw the same in the Industrial Revolution. We saw the same in the move to the Internet. I think a lot of technologies or a lot of industries are going to be changed and radically more jobs are going to be created over time. All right. Four Thought CEO Dion Nicholas, a founder carrier that's building right here and was on the show earlier in the year. It's interesting to track the progress that he's made since then. Thank you very much to Dion. All right, coming up next on Bloomberg Technology, we will return to the picket line as studios and screenwriters reach a tentative deal to end their months-long strike. We have more details and analysis coming up ahead. From San Francisco and New York City, this is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. Okay, for today's Going Viral, we're focusing on football. And Taylor Swift showing up to the Kansas City Chiefs game, sitting in Travis Kelsey's box with his mother Donna. You see her there in Caroline. I don't know if you saw this. NFL on Fox Handle on X posts this video <laughs> of her celebrating that third quarter touchdown by Kelsey. And the numbers on that video, astonishing. Meanwhile, does anyone know what the numbers were in the score? I feel like that none of that got actually focused on in the game. I think it was, what, 10.41 in the end. Absolutely trounced the Bears. But ultimately, I mean, she said in a, what, one of her songs before, I think it's Gold Rush, that she liked the Eagles, which I think is where his brother plays. But all of this, right. while what, the NFL's trying to talk up who's going to be at their big Super Bowl. And once again, as a 90s kid growing up, I'm all in on who they've decided to choose. But isn't it ultimately about just entertainment and football really intertwining at this moment? You know, as a team, we were discussing this about a week ago, was it? And we were saying, no way. Taylor Swift, Kelsey, no way. Look at the social media response. And yes, you're right, 10 to 41. But when NFL and Fox tweeted the final score, yeah. they had 10 to 41 and Taylor Swift in the middle of the image. <laughs> what a world we live in. And I'm pretty sure the numbers on the videos got a little bit more for her face being on it. 
across the world of technology it was trending meanwhile though let's stay in the world of entertainment for a moment because we also got a key story to talk about and the hollywood writers of course the studios reaching that tentative deal over the weekend to end strikes which began back in may and here to discuss it, Stephen Wolf Ferreira, his Three Plus Studios Chief Business Officer. And what's been so good about you, Stephen, is you've come in time and time again since May when they first went on strike to really talk about the impact this is having on your industry. And ultimately, you, yep. do you, are you positive? Are you hopeful that this really might be some coming together now? Thanks again for having me. And I, I am somewhat cautiously optimistic. I mean, the reality is this has had a huge toll on the entertainment industry at large. You know, since May, you've seen, you know, billions of dollars being taken out of the entertainment industry. And the reality is they need to get back to work. So um, we're glad that we have a tentative agreement. It needs now to go to the Guild members, and hopefully on Tuesday they will vote and ratify this. Um, but it's still going to be some time before folks get back to work. Precisely. Well, certainly from the drama side of things, mm. dramatic, you, you still need the actors to work. Yes, you might be able yep. to have some talk shows going back, but Stephen, are you hopeful in that that's mm. the next shoe to drop here? Yes, I mean, you know, there's uh, something called pattern matching uh, when you start to negotiate. Um, you know, remember the Directors Guild, they went back to work mm. um, a couple of months ago. And so it took a while before we actually saw the writers kind of really come back to the table. Um, you know, they weren't negotiating for, for weeks, if not months. And so now all eyes are on sag -Aftra. Uh, we really need to see, um, you know, kind of this come to an end. Um, the good news is the writers will no longer be picketing. Um, you know, you now have uh, the permission for some of the writers to support their actors uh, in their guild. But um, but we're hopeful that, you know, production can start, you know, once you actually have the negotiations agreed upon and, you know, the I is dotted, the T's, um, you now are going to have to revamp productions. And so it's going to take a little bit, you know, maybe two or three months for all productions to come back fully. That's what we're talking about, Stephen, the latency mm -hmm. of the impact of these strikes, right? We're talking about the supply chain yeah. behind making mm -hmm. content. Do you get any sense from your industry and your world, you know, how delayed, how far into the future these strikes will be felt? Because it takes time to make shows. Mm -hmm. That's right. I mean, you know, the, the first thing that will come back will be talk shows, right? So like late night will come back first. Um, you know, some of the daytime talk shows, you know, those are things where it won't be as impacted. But when you think about all the key things that were being negotiated around data, about, you know, kind of residuals that comes to streaming, um, you know, and certainly the use of AI, which everyone is really still very nervous about, um, you know, those things are still going to kind of take time to really play out. And so we really need, you know, SAG, SAG after to kind of come back to the table along with the studios and hopefully that could be resolved because if this continues past October, you know, now you're really going to get into all the production schedules. And remember, actors cannot promote their films. Mm -hmm. And so that has a huge impact. I mean, you've seen, you know, major, you know, big budget films like Dune 2 get pushed from, you know, 2023 into 24. And so whether it's streaming residuals, data, AI, those issues are going to hopefully get resolved in some way. It'll be a short term fix to be sure. But we need the industry to come back because it's impacting everyone. I mean, just look at all the big, um, you know, kind of media companies. You know, certainly Netflix is probably up uh, about 20% since May 2nd when the strike started. But all the other traditional media companies, Disney down 20%, uh, Paramount down almost 50%. So it really is taking a toll on the industry. The, the big media companies, big Caroline, I get the sense also the big names mm -hmm. that lead them, right? When we yeah. speak to Lucas Shaw, Caroline, it's important to know mm -hmm. the people around the table that are trying to fix this. Yeah, and I do think, I'm sure it's top of mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ted Saranos can perhaps see his share price still going on the higher side, but he was at the table, the CEO mm -hmm. of Netflix. We do know that Bob Iger was there too, probably with his shareholders front and centre for him as well. And I'm interested, Stephen, how important you think mm -hmm. it is that the leading executives are there in part of the conversation conversation driving it forward. Look, this has gotten resolved, to be very clear. We got Bob Iger from Disney, Ted Sarandos from Netflix, Donna Langley from NBC Universal, and David Zaslav from Warner Brothers Discovery. They have been meeting with the Writers Guild of America, and that is how this kind of blockage got unblocked. And so why didn't this happen months ago? I mean, we're in day 147 of the strike, right? You know, when it comes to Tuesday, you're going to have almost 150 days. I wish people could have come to the table because this has had such an impact. I mean, I don't think people realize that the average, you know, kind of wage, you know, the average salary for a writer is about $53,000. You know, it's not kind of all the, you know, big, you know, kind of top 1% of writers or directors or actors that are getting, you know, kind of millions 
millions in dollars, the average person that's being impacted this is really, yeah. truly impacted. And so I'm glad that they came to the table, but that is how this got unblocked. Uh, Stephen, when these strikes started, the conversation that the three of us were having mm -hmm. was about AI and the long-term mm -hmm. impact of AI. To your mind, has it just become more clear that pay is the mm -hmm. central issue here? I mean, pay is not just a central issue. I mean, they're all like we are so at the dawn of the AI era. We truly are not going to be able to imagine that once you move past the ability to ask questions to things like generative AI and chat GPT, when you start moving from questions to actual actions, I mean, the ability to do a, a modern day Turing test where you actually tell, you know, an AI chatbot, hey, here's a hundred thousand dollars go out and make a million dollars on Amazon and it'll set up its own store. It'll figure out what are the trending products. It'll do all the marketing, the creative, and it will generate a million dollars in sales. That is going to happen. And so every single brand, every single industry, every single person is going to be impacted by AI. And so we haven't even scratched the surface on where this is going to go, but I feel like they have, with what we know about AI right now in 2023, this agreement for the next three years hopefully kind of puts in place, but this is going to come back in three years' time, and they're going to have to renegotiate. And just imagine the exponential advances that you see in AI. It's going to be here to stay, and it's going to wreak havoc on the industry. Stephen Wolf Pereira, it's been great to get your industry perspective as these strikes have gone on. We will check in soon, I'm sure. Uh, let's get a quick check in on the markets, Caroline. NASDAQ 100 has kind of turned a corner. We're modestly higher, up three tenths of 1%, uh, up for a second straight day. We've opened the session loader, but the, the narrative is about the Fed, central banks around the world holding rates higher for longer to impact the, uh, the, the ongoing inflation that we see around the world. That has been the narrative of, since that Fed meeting of last week. There's an area of the market that I want to check in, in on, and that is biotech. What's got me thinking is we've had all these conversations recently about Boston, and Boston is kind of the heart of this biotech industry. It is an underperformer, down Two and a half, uh, two tenths of one percent. It had been down even more significantly. This is an index down for a fourth straight day. It's trading at its lowest level since March. We have seen biotech headlines hit the terminal, uh, terminal, but valuations really under pressure. And I know that it's going to be a big theme later on in the show. Yeah, look, look we're going to be deep diving into it, Ed. And I love the fact that you're shining a light on biopharma because we're going to look at the state of it, the industry in general, how it's incorporating. You guessed it, AI, more broadly, technology. Please to say we're going to be joined by the CEO of Benchling in a moment. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. All right, time for talking tech. And first up, Apple's basic iPhone 15 model is taking almost twice as long for deliveries this year than its predecessor last year, among high demand for the company's latest handsets. Buyers in the U.S. need to wait for 10 days to receive the basic model, up from six days for the previous generation of device. And Huawei largely omitted mention of its controversial Mate 60 smartphone series at a grand showcase of its new consumer products earlier today. The company said it will increase smartphone production in response to demand without naming the handset that's triggered the surge, which has an advanced made-in-China processor causing concern in Washington. Plus, Booking's 1.6 billion euro takeover of Sweden's eTravely Group was blocked by the European Union after merger regulators concluded that the proposed acquisition would harm the market for online travel agencies. Caroline. Let's just take a move to global biopharma right now, Ed. The industry is racing to produce better drugs faster. And look, it's going to need two key things, technology and AI, in fact, to improve the scale and the innovation. At least that's the take from Benchling, cloud-based platform for scientific research and development, which just released a report on the state of the biopharma industry and its adoption of technology. I'm pleased to welcome Benchling CEO, co-founder as well, Sajid Wikramasakra, of course, who's joining us now. And Sajid... How are you seeing the adoption of technology, or lack thereof, in your biotech industry right now? Yeah. Good morning, and, and thanks for having me. Uh, as quick context, uh, we started Benchling a decade ago to bring modern software to cutting-edge science. Today, our R&D cloud is used by more than 1,200 companies globally, small and large, so think household names like Gilead and Sanofi, to capture and structure their scientific data often for machine learning, but broadly in service of bringing cutting-edge, life-changing products to people faster. 
I actually just got back from BenchTalk, our annual customer conference in Boston, where I spoke with hundreds of scientists who are working on everything from uh, gene editing cures to heart disease to personalized cancer vaccines to treatments to slow the progression of Alzheimer's. So needless to say, it's a, it's a very exciting time to be in science. Now, how, how much has information sharing been a blocker? Saji, how much is what you're offering going to change the game or not? Because for many, you would feel that that collaboration, that sharing of information is already occurring within the labs. Yeah. To state the obvious, uh, science is incredibly complex and difficult. And anecdotally at Benchling, we've always we've known some of the challenges posed by technology for progress in the sciences. You know, you have paper notebooks and spreadsheets and really old homegrown and, and legacy technology that makes it hard to collaborate. But my, my inner scientists always wanted more, more primary data to really quantify the progress the, the industry has made and to understand how much work there is in front of us to, to do. So this summer we spoke with hundreds of scientists, R&D leaders and, and IT executives uh, and produced the first state of tech in, in biopharma report. Uh, the headline, Carolyn, is that uh, this is an industry that hasn't really seen the benefits of digital transformation yet, but it's one of the industries that needs it the most. If I dive into the data, uh, the first thing scientists told us is that there's actually too much software. And I, I hope you see the irony of me, a CEO of a <laughs> software company, saying that there's, there's too much technology. But scientists, on average, have to use more than five highly specialized scientific applications per day to do their job. Uh, and these applications aren't the same throughout the entire organization. Some of the IT executives we spoke to have to manage an environment with hundreds of different tools that actually don't talk to one another. Only 28% of organizations feel like that data generated is actually interoperable. Uh, and that's a big problem when 84% of organizations project that their data is actually going to double in the next 12 months. So zooming out, this is an industry that's funding tens of billions of dollars in R&D outside of clinical trials, and most of that knowledge ends up trapped in silos. So G, you talked about technology for progress. I would say that the vast majority of conversations that Caroline and I have about AI in the healthcare, or more specifically biotech, biopharma uh, use case, is how it expedites drug development mm -hmm. or gene therapy development. How uh, does your research reflect that, that that's the area of most focus right now? Yeah, we found that about 60% of organizations are testing the waters with machine learning and, and AI. Um, and I think that's very much a bright spot. But there is skepticism as to the, the near-term impact that it's going to have. We really see two major challenges that are holding the industry back from realizing the full, full potential of AI and ML. Uh, the first is a talent gap. You know, being best in class here requires some of the brightest minds in science, but also some of the brightest minds from technology, data science, and machine learning. And historically, these are two industries that actually haven't mixed that much and have very different cultures. The other major challenge we see is in having purpose-built tools that actually advance the science, and that's where we're spending our time investing. I've met so many highly qualified people, PhDs, working in this field who complain that a lot of their time in the lab is spent pipetting oh. something from one stage to the next. But it, it raises questions about automation. Um, and that seems to be an area in more near term where machine learning in, in conjunction with hardware can be really helpful. Yeah, we actually just launched a new product in support of that at BenchTalk, our customer conference. Majority of scientific experimentation involves instruments, and that's where vast majority of the data generation is happening. And so we've been focusing some of our investments on automating the flow of data out of instruments and into systems like BenchLink for automated data analysis and capture in support of machine learning. Sarjeet, it's great to have some time with you. Stay well. Come back. Sarjeet Wickrama, Sakuri, he's of course the CEO of BenchLink. We thank him. Meanwhile, coming up, fintech opportunities. In Latin America, we are going so global today. We're going to be discussing more with the CEO of Argentinian and now Mexican fintech company, really focused on Latin America more broadly. We could talk to the Uala CEO. This is Bloomberg. dive on a fintech pinup at the moment. Walla is expanding further into the Latin American market. Promise of expanding financial inclusion in the region through access to 
pretty much comprehensive ecosystem of financial services. It's currently over 5 million users in Argentina, Colombia and now Mexico after getting approval for a banking license in Latin America's second biggest economy. That happened earlier this year. For now, let's talk about the story with Wallace Expansion, the founder, CEO, Pier Paolo Barbieri. It's great to have you in the studio. Thank you. And What's so interesting at the moment is the way in which you expand outside of Argentina, already pretty dominant there, into Mexico. Why was Mexico so attractive? What is it that really boosts the business there? Mexico is an amazing market where you only have 49 banks, and yet 90% of all transactions are still conducted in cash, right on the border with the United States. And so the opportunity for financial inclusion and for technology and financial services in Mexico is ginormous. You have 70 million people who've never had a debit card, who've never been able to save, who've never been able to take payments. And so as this digitizes in the next decade, we want to be there and we want to bet on it big. That's why we just acquired a bank in Mexico and we can now offer everything from payments to savings accounts, high yield savings accounts in Mexico, and also charging services, investments, and a variety of things making up an ecosystem of all financial services. VCs have been betting on you big, I'm sure, because of that intersection of, well, you experience of Bridgewater with Soros, with Goldman, you work there, you're bringing this financial focus to your home. What are some of the issues in particular when you're thinking of oh, inflation, when you're thinking of political instability? I mean, we think at the moment of one of the front runners for Argentina in particular, talking of dollarization, an end to the central bank. How does that affect you as a business leader? I think the digitization of payments is a global trend that is going to happen everywhere. And in emerging markets, it has the opportunity to leapfrog developed markets. As we saw, China did it faster than many other developed markets like the Europeans or even Japan. And we then saw it in India, then we saw it in Brazil. And now in the rest of Latin America, we see an amazing opportunity. We launched Walla five and a half years ago in Argentina. We have 17% of the adults in the country and we give them tools to save. With Walla, they can buy dollars already, they can invest in U.S. equities, they can have the best high-yield savings account in the country and protect themselves against inflation. But we also see that in Colombia, we also see that in Mexico. So we see an opportunity that is very wide-ranging in a region of the world that is lagging because only 20% of payments are digital. One of the very few things I know is that in the future, that number is going to go to 40, to 60, to 80, as it did in Brazil and India. So it's a one-way street and the political noise has always been there and we need to learn to live with it. But I do think that in the case of Argentina, it is moving toward a more uh, pro-market stance with the elections that are coming up in October. Pierre Paolo, if Javier Millet is successful and he does dollarize the economy and he does close the central bank, how do you prepare Walla for that? How do you change your business model to take that into account? Well, of course, the, the first thing is that, is that in Argentina, only banks are allowed to have dollar accounts already. We already offer dollar trading in Walla, whereas fintechs and wallets cannot do it. And there, we have the strength of having fully regulated entities that allow us to do everything from investments to lending, and in this case, dollar accounts. Uh, we've seen this. I mean, what, what I think will happen in Argentina is that we're going to move toward a more open capital account. And that's how we already operate in Mexico. That's how we already operate in Colombia. And once again, the speed of the digitization of services with a dollar would only yes. accelerate. So in that sense, it would be actually very positive for the business. And I think banks would be able to do longer term lending. Today, our longest loan in the in a context of 100 percent inflation is two years. Just two years. Imagine that in a country where you offer, you know, 30 30 year fixed mortgages. So the opportunity yes. for lending in places like Argentina is huge because only seven to eight percent of people have access to formal uh, credit today. And in a dollarized economy, I think that number would go up a lot. Pia Paolo, quickly, you know, Mexico is a parallel example. Cash is king. Transactions are cash. So what's the technology opportunity for you there, AI or otherwise? Well, what we have in Mexico is, first of all, a full ecosystem of services. Pay your bills, top up your cell phone, have a debit card, pay for Netflix or Spotify, or be able to sign up even for Bloomberg. All those things Mexicans couldn't do in the past because they were condemned to cash. They even charged you a fee to pay your water bill or your electricity bill. Walla does away with all that, and it lets you create a credit history like we have in Argentina, where we have already done more than 5 million loans. And that gives us the opportunity to create a new credit history and also right. offer a high yield savings account, which in Mexico is a huge differential in a market where most people got zero for their money and no longer. Yeah. You come to New York a bit, come back. Pierre Biovieri is, of course, the founder and CEO of Walla. We thank him for it. Meanwhile, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, Ed. Yeah, recap the show on our podcast, Apple, Spotify, iHeart and the Bloomberg platforms from here in SF and New York City. This is Bloomberg Technology.